So let me give the quick introduction to Ian Downey. When I was a wee lad, in 2007, I think I heard about this guy who had the audacity to call himself famous. And he, he was in this band called Ian Downey is Famous. And I was like, what the hell is that? Who does that, you know? And so I really wanted to find out more. And um, I started sidling up to him because I really wanted to be famous too. And so my fame really comes from his fame. You know, that's, I'm running coattails here. Um, and then in 2009, this space was open, the one you're sitting in now, and we actually had a benefit next door at the bar, and uh, Ian Downey's Famous played, and I will never forget the energy of that show. Like, there were people playing bongos, and they had like, um, the sticks, I'm not remembering what those are called. Claves. Claves, thank you, in the back. Uh, sure, yes. And we were having a great time just making rhythm, and then suddenly the band, like Chris Reeg, who's the bassist, started playing the bass rhythm, and then Ian started like ripping out some sort of riff on his guitar, and before you knew it, the whole band was playing, and everybody was, was making noise and jumping simultaneously. That, it was amazing. I, I was blown away. It's like, this, this guy, I gotta stay next to this guy, you know, because he's great, he's great. Um, from there, it went on to <laughs> really interesting progression. Um, we did a show upstairs on Halloween uh, called um, Frankenstein Revival, The Rise of Uterus Face. It is online. If you ever want to see this performance piece, it's amazing. It was put on by the Bloody Nose, and uh, we filmed it. The small Flying Squirrel and the media filmed it, and it was just un unreal. I played the doctor, I believe. I had, I had a fake stomach filled with candy that was bashed open at the end, and then people ate out of my stomach. <laughs> like, it was amazing! And, and at this time, and that I was, you know, sidling up to Ian, I also met Ian's partner, Mary, and I realized that they were in this duo called The Bloody Nose, and it was surreal. And Mary, I think, is really the brains behind the whole thing, but Ian does all the crazy shit. Maybe not, though. I don't know. But, but maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe not. We'll have, we'll have breakfast soon and figure this all out. I, just, I need to know the, the real deal here. Um, from there, I recall uh, Ian and Mary both helping with some, me with some blood effects in a cowboy movie I made. There was um, uh, this, this, uh, this zine I wrote about a love affair between Nikola Tesla and um, uh, Captain Ahab. And they did like a visual representation of this the zine replete with sexual acts. It was, it was crazy. Um, I wasn't in that show, I just watched. Because it was too close, it was too close. Um, and then from there, somehow I was recruited to be Santa Claus in Santanalia. How many of you have been to Santanalia? Zero, one. What? One, all right. Well, when, it, when they do it again, I urge you all. It's like the truth about Christmas, it's amazing. Um, and there's like a ninja Santa Claus and like evil Santa Claus and they're battling and people died and things exploded, reindeer crashed. I mean, the whole pageantry of it is just phenomenal. Um, Which one were you? I don't remember. <laughs> I did it like four times, three times. There was a Tesla coil involved at one point. I really have no I idea. Think you're evil Santa. I think it was too. I think it was yeah. an evil one. Coke Santa Coca Claus. Santa. Yeah, Coke Santa Claus. That's right. Yeah. So. Which is an interesting point, because the Santa Claus we all understand today, the big fat guy with the red and white suit, Coca-Cola in the 1930s, painted billboards across the country with this version of Santa Claus, and they're you know, pumping their Coke product. That's where we get white Santa Claus from, people. Nothing about Jesus in that. <laughs> Anyways. Oh, but this is a great segue, right? Because we're talking about capitalism and Coke and, and Santa Claus. Yeah, 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 all right. So I'm really excited because I've been telling people about this lecture, I'm like, Ian isn't going to come up here and be a stuffy fucking Marxist and tell you why you should all become anti-capitalist douchebags, right? He's going to come up here and he's going to ask you to enter into a, a, a state of imagination where Karl Marx is blowing pink bubblegum so large that it encompasses his whole beard and pops. And then it's like, how do we get all that shit out of his beard, right? And this, as I understand it at least, maybe he is going to get up here and be like a Marxist tool and just lay it out for us, why we need to become anti-capitalist. But from what I recall, 
in a conversation we had months ago, sometime when we talked about this, um, it was more about those paradoxes of Karl Marx and these sticky situations where you're not quite sure if you should actually believe what this man's saying, or you should, you don't really quite know, is he exploiting workers, is he a worker, is he not a worker, is he revolutionary, is he counter-revolutionary? Well, Ian Downey is going to tell us the truth of all of this tonight, and I am so excited. I can't believe he's here tonight. This is great. So, Ian, thank you so much for doing this, and without further ado, Ian Downey, everyone. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that amazing introduction. I felt like it was, felt like it was in This Is Your Life. Um, oh, yo, 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 yo. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Uh, I, I, I've never done anything quite like this before, so uh, we'll see how this works. Um, I, I'm, I, I should stand very still. No, no, no. Understand no. I have to stand over here. Is there a way to not be blocked by that and no. also not block that? No. So one way or another, <laughs> something will be blocked, but it's, it's all good. It, 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 it builds up the tension, you know? To constantly never quite get what you want, it's exciting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, or I could do this. I could be, I, I really, what I want is the, the, like an earpiece. I want to be like uh, Bill Gates. <laughs> Bill Gates, is that who it was? Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs. Hey, they're all the same. Yeah. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> uh, nice mic stand. Yeah. Uh, uh, I could do the Steven Tyler, like, Hanks. Everyone's <laughs> trying. Um, so. Thanks again to Ted and Flying Squirrel. This is really exciting. Um, so uh, I, I, I've got these notes here of what, what I'm going to write, uh, what I'm going to talk about, and like that I, I tried to. I, I was working on it at work, and uh, and so I tried to disguise it as like a memo, like for the actual work, so the first paragraph like looks like it's like a work memo, and then as you go down the page, it's suddenly about Karl Marx, and I have to like figure out where the actual real text of this actually starts. Um, but, so, uh, yeah, uh, Ted asked me to talk about Karl Marx, which was probably a very stupid thing to do, um, but uh, I guess you asked for it, um, and uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure everything I say today is going to piss off everyone of every political persuasion and every position uh, on every issue. Um, so, so that'll be fun. And uh, uh, so, who who was this Karl Marx? Now, first of all, you notice, know born May fifth, eighteen eighteen, two hundred years ago today. Uh, so this is his birthday. And he kind of looks like, I was talking about Santa Claus, he kind of looks like Santa Claus. Um, I, it would be great if he dressed in red, it would make a lot of sense, but <laughs> I guess they didn't have color photography. So, they probably, we'll, we'll assume that was a red suit. Um, Photoshop. And it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, who, who was this guy? Who was Karl Marx? Um, well, it's a tough question, because it's a type of question that the more you learn, the harder it becomes to answer that question, uh, the more difficult and complicated it is. Um, because we all think we know who Karl Marx was, right? Every, I mean, everybody knows something about Karl Marx. Uh, we all get taught about Karl Marx in school. Um, but, you know, this is, well, 200 years since he was born. Uh, a little more than a hundred years since the Russian Revolution. Uh, so we're dealing with more than a hundred years of, um, you know, there was the whole Cold War and there's propaganda on both sides. Um, you know, there was a very complicated system of propaganda on that side and then a very complicated system of propaganda on this side, whatever that is. Um, and, uh, one thing that's very odd about that is that these two systems of propaganda, at least two, maybe more than that, resemble each other to a great degree. 
And they probably resemble each other more than they resemble reality. Let's <laughs> we'll talk about something as weird as reality. Um, and uh, so, uh, I mean, well, and there's a lot of aspects of our own propaganda that we learn uh, in our society that people don't even realize. Like, for instance, people don't realize that we still live under the Communist Control Act of 1954, uh, signed into law in 1954, never taken off the books, uh, made it illegal to be a member of the Communist Party. Uh, you get up to a $10,000 fine or imprisonment for five years or both. It's never been repealed. Um, and uh, it's never been struck down by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional, even though it clearly is. Um, so uh, I feel like, uh, you know, th th there's all these um, pressures, both subtle and overt. I feel like uh, before you say anything about Karl Marx, you have to declare I am not, and I never have been, a Marxist. Um, so I'll go ahead and declare that. Um, but it's, I, you know, one thing that I kind of like is uh, um, there's a there's a quote uh, attributed to Jean-Paul Sartre. I don't think he ever actually said it, uh, but that he said that he wasn't a communist, but he was also very opposed to anti-communists. Um, which, uh, yeah, I don't think he ever said that because said that, I think he would have just said, yeah, I'm a communist. Um, but it is, a, a, you know, attributed to him, there was a sociologist named Clifford Geertz who talked about being an anti-anti-communist, sort of referencing, referencing uh, Sartre, but it's probably a, a, a misquote. Another good quote uh, is uh, from uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who uh, said that he opposed the communists in theory, but uh, agreed with them in practice. Oh, <laughs> interesting, interesting little twist on things. Um, so I'm not going to get into the depths of uh, Marxist theory here because it's bottomless. Um, I think that maybe more than any other figure that I can think of, um, Marx is a type of figure where you can find uh, more and more, you can find a little piece of information that when you find this piece of information out, it totally, totally changes everything you knew about what you thought you understood about him and forces you to reevaluate everything that you, you thought you knew. Um, so that it's this bottomless well of interpretation and reinterpretation. I'll, I'll give you an example. I just recently discovered, even though I read it before, I didn't notice it, um, that at one point in the, right in the Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx talks about how the, uh, the, the proletariat, the first thing that uh, communists should be working towards is forming the proletariat as a class, implying that they're not already a class yet. So what, what does that mean? I don't know. It, it sort of changes everything, it makes you have to reevaluate. What, what is, uh, what is this? And you know, you keep on having to like, rethink and rethink. And so I'm not going to bother trying to get into all the depths of, of the theory today uh, at all. All I'm going to try to talk about is because these two, at least two, systems of propaganda have existed for more than 100 years, and they parallel each other, they mirror each other in some strange ways, I'm going to talk about some of the things that don't fit into either one. Some of the strange little facts and tidbits that, that cause you to reevaluate uh, everything you thought you knew about this guy. Um, and uh, uh, because, okay, let's take, if you ask the random average person, you know, for instance, what is communism? They're probably going to say something along the lines of, well, there was this guy, Karl Marx, and he was a philosopher, and he came up with a blueprint for a future utopian society based on the principle of equality, that everyone would be uh, equal not only in their rights, 
and equal before the law, but they would be equal in their results. They would get all the same amount of everything, and everyone would be perfectly equal. Um, so the first thing, <laughs> let, let's call that the standard ideology about Marx. The first thing that I would point out about what I'm calling the standard ideology of Marx here is, and when I say that, I don't mean his ideology, I mean ideology about him. The first thing I would point out is that that itself, weirdly enough, if you think of that as a, as a criticism of Marx, it's kind of a Marxist criticism. Like Marx himself, all the time, accused other people of being utopian. And in fact, uh, he may have been the very first person to use the term utopian as an insult. Like before that, you had Thomas More wrote Utopia, uh, this description of this imaginary society where things were more equal, although they're kind of weird and messed up too, if you actually read Thomas More's Utopia. But uh, uh, I think Marx was actually the first person to, to, to use that term utopian as an insult, to say, uh, oh, that, that's mere utopian socialism. And in fact, he loved to do that. He loved to criticize other socialists and other communists as being utopian. So people who are using these terms uh, are actually using his, um, his trope, his, his style of argumentation. They're, in a weird way, they're kind of being Marxist without even realizing that they're doing it. Um, and uh, so uh, the first thing that's wrong with this uh, idea that communism is this idea that Marx invented is that Marx didn't invent it. Not at all. Oh, that's interesting. You can still see the previous slide. I don't know what's going on there. That's interesting. It's like it left a photographic print on the screen. Uh, we're being haunted. So, um, yes. Uh, well, the, the first thing, you know, um, if you look at, for instance, if one problem with this idea that Marx invented communism, if you look at uh, Paris in uh, 1848, there was an election. Uh, the first election ever, I think ever, for president of France. And uh, the social, there were actually two different socialist or communist parties in France at the time. There was one called the Montagnards, uh, who was led by this guy, uh, Le Drew Rouen. And then there was another independent socialist party with a guy named Respy. They, look how many votes they got. They got hundreds of thousands of votes. And they had never heard of Marx. Uh, the Communist Manifesto hadn't been translated into to French yet. Uh, this was already a movement that was happening uh, before, uh, before Marx's works got translated into French. Um, there were, uh, whoa, what was that? someone's bowling, <laughs> uh, and I think they got a strike. Um, Sorry, I didn't oh, no, 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 that's fine. It's okay. I just didn't know what, what happened. Okay. France was really seen as the, the center of communism and socialism at the time. Uh, Germany, there really wasn't a Germany. Germany had not formed together into a single nation at that point. And it was sort of seen as a backwater. It was not seen as an important center of socialism. Um, and uh, partly because it had not developed industrially to the extent that, that France had. Um, you can go back even further. Um, and talk about this guy. Well, actually, so the first person, Antien Gabriel Morelli, he was the real first uh, communist leader in France. Uh, we don't have any pictures of him because we don't really know who he was. Uh, we have his writings, but uh, most people think that this was a pen name, uh, that he was just writing under an assumed name. Uh, some people think that it was actually the philosopher Diderot, uh, who was the leader of the encyclopedists, which would be really interesting if that turned out to be true. Um, after him came a guy named Gabriel Bonon de Magli. That's his picture right there. We do know a bunch about him. 
because uh, he was the older brother of uh, Condorcet, another famous mm -hmm. French philosopher. They helped raise um, the young Rousseau, uh, who became one of the most famous philosophers of all time. Um, and uh, uh, Rousseau also used this term bourgeois that would eventually become important in, in Marxist philosophy. Um, so France was definitely the, the cent had been the center, obviously you can see, since well before Marx was even born, unless you think of England, which was even more of a center. Uh, there are so many communists and socialist leaders in England. Uh, Thomas Hodgkin, who wrote Political Economy in 1827. William Thompson, uh, who wrote an inquiry into the principles of the redistribution of wealth most conducive to human happiness in 1824. Uh, T.R. Emmons, who wrote Practical and Political uh, Economy. Uh, the, actually, what I'm right, reading right now is a quote from Karl Marx himself. Uh, and the, what he puts it there is, et cetera, et cetera, and four more pages of et ceteras. Um, because there were just so many of these writers in England. There was a, there was a battle that happened. Uh, people nicknamed it Peterloo uh, because it happened in St. Peter's Square and it was kind of like Waterloo for Napoleon. It happened in 1819 when Marx was only one year old. Uh, there was a, a big public speaker named Henry Hunt who led a bunch of uh, uh, radicals and they, they tried a widespread revolt in London. It got put down. The poet Percy Shelley wrote about it uh, in a poem, famous poem called The Mask of Anarchy. Um, if you want a real founder of communism, a good candidate would be a guy named Thomas Spence, 750 to 1814, who coined the phrase the rights of man uh, long before the Declaration of Rights of Man, or before Thomas Paine for the Bill of Rights, and so on and so forth. Uh, some of the people who were involved in Peterloo went on to form the Cato Street Conspiracy, where they tried to assassinate the Prime Minister and uh, take over England. That all happened in uh, 1820. Marx was only two years old. Um, and then, besides France and England, there was also the United States. Uh, there were all of these socialist and communist experiments going on in America. Uh, Neshoba, Brook Farm, New Harmony, Icaria. Um, you can read a book from, uh, by a guy who lived right around here uh, named John Humphrey Noyes, N-O-Y-E-S, who wrote The History of American Socialism in 1870. And he goes right back to uh, the um, original uh, people who came from Europe and uh, settled in America, a lot of whom had sort of quasi, well, they were very religious, and they had sort of quasi-socialist social organizations. The Quakers and the Shakers, uh, to a major extent, had these sort of communistic, you know, sharing their items. You know, in a way, you could say, um, when you're, nowadays, if you uh, are critical of the economic structure that exists, um, and you want to fight for the poor people of the world, People call you a communist, but they used to have another name for it. They used to call it Christianity. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of these religious movements, and actually not just Christianity. Uh, you can see similar uh, ideas in various uh, Jewish movements and Muslim movements and uh, religions all over the world have. I mean, if you look, um, the book of Acts in the Bible, Acts 2, 2 44 to 45, uh, and they that believed were all together and had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. That's widely believed to be the origin of the famous phrase, from each according to their ability, to each according to their need, which Marx definitely did not um, uh, originate. Uh, besides that biblical reference, uh, you can see that in the writings of Louis Blanc in uh, Morally, who I've already mentioned. Uh, it was the uh, masthead of a newspaper um, that Louis Blanc was one of the editors of. Uh, some of the other famous phrases that we associate with, with Karl Marx. Um, workers of the world unite. 
Carl Schopper came up with that. Uh, religion is the opiate of the masses. Uh, Bruno Bauer uh, used that phrase. Uh, Heinrich Heine said something very similar, and so did Novalis. Probably the biggest influence on, on Marx was a guy named Edward Gantz. Uh, even bigger than Hegel, I would say. People often associate Marx with Hegel. I think that's a little bit exaggerated. Uh, one of Hegel's um, contemporaries, uh, Edward Gantz, who Hegel had a lot of respect for. The respect went both ways. Um, he, he directly uh, taught Karl Marx, and you can see, well, it's, it's not over there quite yet. Uh, you can see a big, uh, big influence on that. But let's, let's move ahead. Um, so, if Marx was not the originator of communism, what was it? Who was he? He was a reporter. He was a journalist. He was a newspaper man. He worked for the New York Herald Tribune, or the New York Daily Tribune, as it was called at that point. Uh, that was before all this media consolidation. Um, that was his longest stint of steady employment. And during his tenure at the Trib, it was the most popular newspaper in the United States of America. Um, so, yeah, uh, sometimes I think people kind of kill the messenger. They, 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 uh, they, they blame Marx for, uh, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious when I use the word blame, for inventing communism, or they credit him for inventing communism. But that's like if you blame Wolf Witzer for inventing Al-Qaeda. Uh, <laughs> you know, Marx was, wasn't... Uh, he wasn't inventing communism, he was reporting about communism, he was making it manifest to the general public, right? Thus the manifesto. Uh, and you, you've got to understand, this is a time, this is a time before cell phones, time before the internet. Um, there were all of these struggles going on throughout Europe, but they weren't coordinated in any way and they didn't know about each other. And basically the only way for them to learn about each other was through the press. Uh, and so Marx really believed deeply in the importance of the press. He, was, uh, he, he fought for the press. He fought for the freedom of the press. Let's, let's go to this next slide. Something that's often forgot about Marx. Uh, how, how important he believed was the freedom of the press. Uh, and you can learn about this from <laughs> an essay with a, a title that uh, makes it pretty clear. On the freedom of the press, it's called. Uh, and by the way, this is also the uh, anniversary not only of his birth, but of this article. Let's, let's, let's look at this for a second. The free press is the everywhere open eye of the people's spirit, the people's embodied self-consciousness, the, the speaking ribbon that connects the individual with the state and world, culture made flesh, which transforms material struggles into spiritual ones and idealizes their crude material form. It is the uninhibited confession of the people to itself, and confession leads to redemption. It is the spiritual mirror in which a people contemplates itself. It is all-sided, omnipresent, omniscient. It is the ideal world that is constantly spilling out into the actual one, and as an ever-richer spirit, newly animating, flowing back into it. No one... I don't think. No one would think that that was a speech that came from Karl Marx. That's not what we think of when we think of Karl Marx, and yet that is what he wrote. And as a matter of fact, that was basically the, the piece of writing for which he owes his career. That, that was, people were so impressed by that piece of writing that that's how he got into the newspaper business. He, uh, on the strength of this essay, and it's, uh, it is using sort of Hegelian language, but it's interesting, already at this young age, uh, he's already sort of twisting and changing Hegel, because Hegel had uh, famously written an essay towards the end of his life uh, called On the English Charter, where Hegel was basically like, forget freedom of the press. Freedom of the press is bullcrap. It's terrible. <laughs> forget democracy. These are all things you don't want. And Marx was using Hegel's own language, and if you look at this, he's kind of describing the press the way Hegel would describe the state, which probably is part of the reason that uh, LaSalle, another leader from the same time, at one point actually said that the press is superior to the state. He probably was 
influenced by Marx by saying that. And it's a strange thing to say. If the press is superior to the state, what does that mean? But in a way, that's kind of what we're saying when we talk about freedom of the press. We're talking about the, the, the press is somehow <coughs> untouchable. That you can't, uh, it, it can't be uh, subordinated to the rest of the state. Um, and uh, now I'm sure some people are going to read this, especially some traditional Marxists are going to look at this and they're going to say, okay, but that was when Marx was young. Uh, he was just like a kid. Um, and he, didn't, he was very unrealistic, he was very idealistic. But then, you look, the end of his life, uh, this is from 1880, this is only three years before he died, he was virtually on his deathbed. And by, by the way, he had a long, protracted illness uh, dealing with these carbuncles that were all over his body. And so while he's you know, lying in his deathbed, more or less, he's writing the program of the French Workers' Party, demand number one. Abolition of all laws over the press, meetings and associations, and above all, the law against the International Working Men's Association, blah, blah, blah. That's, yeah, yeah. You get my point here. Uh, uh, he was absolutely dedicated to freedom of the press for his whole life, and he didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk. He was constantly... Uh, as a uh, writer and as an editor. He was an editor, sometimes he, uh, uh, he was an editor of the, the Rheinische Zeitung, uh, and then the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, the New Rheinisch um, News, you could translate that as. Um, he was constantly pushing the envelope, because you have to remember, this is a time period. You know, a lot of people have it in their heads that Marx was a guy who was living in some kind of democratic, free society, and he was trying to impose some kind of totalitarian system on everyone else. The truth is the exact opposite. Marx was living at a time when most of the countries in Europe were monarchies, they were duchies, they were, uh, you know, had these sort of quasi-feudal arrangements, and they had no freedom of the press, they had no freedom of speech, and he was constantly, tirelessly working for freedom of the press, for democracy. Um, and, uh, you know, people are surprised to hear that, but it's absolutely true. Um, and let me see, I think this may be the next slide. Yeah, okay, this is a, an exciting one. Um, this was, uh, this is... One of the newspapers that he was the editor of. He actually, uh, uh, he, he was a pretty good uh, businessman, contrary to a lot of uh, um, things that people say about them. He sort of turned this newspaper around from being terribly in debt to running a profit. Um, and actually, somewhat ironically, he got into a, a conflict with some of the... Uh, the printers that were working for him, you know, running the actual printing press, uh, not only was he, you know, not paying them high enough wages, he actually was just not paying them. Where they were owed <laughs> bad wages for a long, Wait, long... Wait, did that? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway... Mark did wage theft, apparently. Oh. <laughs> wage theft, wage theft. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, um... Uh, this is right before um, his newspaper got banned by the authorities, and he had to uh, uh, basically leave the country. And uh, they, they published their final issue uh, in red ink to show how angry they were. Uh, and uh, one of the, 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 the article that Marx wrote for that issue, the title is, No More Taxes. You know, not, again, not a phrase you definitely associate with, with Karl Marx, but... Um, so, uh, this, and another thing you'll notice here, Organ der Demokratie, Organ of Democracy. He was, uh, he was working for these uh, uh, democratic organizations that were trying to spread democracy throughout Europe. Um, let's see if I... I'm sort of skipping through my fingers, so I'm losing my place. But um, 
he, he worked for several different uh, democratic organizations. There was one called, I believe, the, the Democratic Federation, I think. Uh, there were three of them that he worked for. And uh, you don't think of him as uh, fighting for democracy, but that's what he was doing for a lot of his life. Um, Okay. And by the way, <laughs> here's a touchy subject. He was, uh, I guess, it, what we in America would call fighting for the Second Amendment. He was, uh, obviously, it wasn't the Second Amendment in this case because he was in, uh, well, here he was in London, but he was, he was talking about Germany, he was talking about other countries. The whole pro proletariat must be armed at once with muskets, rifles, cannon, and ammunition. And the revival of the old style citizens militia directed against the workers must be opposed. Where the formation of this militia cannot be prevented, the workers must try to organize themselves independently as a proletarian guard with elected leaders and with their own elected general staff. They must try to place themselves not under the orders of the state authority, but under the revolutionary local councils set up by the workers. Under no pretext should arms and ammunition be surrendered. Any attempt to disarm the workers must be frustrated by force if necessary. Um, this is, by the way, this is from Address of the Central Committee to the Communist League. I highly recommend reading this whole um, speech that he gave. It's, I think it's much a, a much better introduction to Marx's political ideas than the Communist Manifesto. I mean, if you want to read about the Bourbons and the... Uh, you know, all these various uh, obscure groups you can read the Communist Manifesto. But I think in this, this, this piece right here, which is a couple of years later, and he's a little bit hardened by the experiences of the revolutions that swept through Europe in 1848, and basically they were all defeats. But he uh, had, had, I think this is a great, um, a great text to look at. Um, Excuse me, yeah, I must say that last phrase, it, it sounds like, you know, you want our arms come and get us. You can have my own individual uh, weapon if you can pry it loose from the cold. Then I know, it sounds like Charlton Heston. It really <laughs> does. It really does, yeah. Um, where, oh, where did you find the text? Oh, I, actually, pretty much all the text that I'm, that I'm referencing here, there's a great website called Marxists. Dot .org, and uh, that one is available there. Um, uh, I think pretty much everything that I'm gonna, that's gonna be on all the slides is there. It's a great website, and a lot of information is available for free there. <laughs> they, at one point, they actually tried to upload the MEGA, which the M E the M E G A, the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe, which means the <laughs> the complete works of Marx and Engels. And uh, they quickly got into a copyright issue. <laughs> and so they had to take down a lot of the stuff. But there's still a lot of stuff up there. You can read, you can, you know, read for years and not run out of stuff. Um, by the way, uh, speaking of the uh, uh, freedom of speech, a, a lot of the, uh, um, the current standards that we have here in America um, about freedom of speech are, come from court cases of Marxists and sometimes anarchists uh, who, you know, dared to defy what was considered uh, acceptable speech at the time and it went to the Supreme Court. Um, the Schenck case is probably the most famous. That was where the phrase clear and present danger comes from. Also, uh, Debs versus the United States. That's Eugene Debs, the socialist leader who ran for uh, president. Uh, Whitney versus California, Dennis versus the United States. Uh, not to mention the ACLU itself, in a way, really started out as uh, the sort of legal wing of uh, a socialist organization, and then it, uh, it evolved out of what was called the National Civil Liberties Bureau, uh, which the Lusk Committee determined to be a dangerous, seditious, socialist propaganda organization. Um, and I think it's worth saying that um, people today, whether they call themselves Marxists or not, who are opposed to freedom of speech, freedom of the press, um, are people without any sense of tactics, any sense of strategy. 
they're complete morons, self-destructive <laughs> people, because they're not realizing that every time freedom of speech is taken away, every time freedom of the press is taken away, they always attack the communists first. They always come for the first. You know, it's, the, it's like that famous saying, first they came in for the communists. Uh, I did not resist because I was not a communist. Then they came for the social democrats. I didn't resist because I wasn't a social democrat. Uh, we don't know this quote, right? Um, so, let's keep on rolling. This is uh, an example of Marx's writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, in a way, I, I see him as a... Uh, uh, as, as, as one of the first modernists. Uh, I mean, this is, I feel so bad for poor Friedrich Engels, his best friend who had to work through all of his writings um, because it's indecipherable. It, but some of this is just little dots and like wiggly <laughs> lines. Who knows what it says? Um, I, it, it, it's, he really seemed like an experimental writer. He was, he was a great writer. This next one I, I think I, I like even better. You can see, uh, it's like an abstract painting. Like, on this side, it's, it kind of looks like words, but what words could they possibly be? By the time you get to this side, it's faces. Look at this. You can see, like, little, he's drawing little faces. Now, everybody doodles. I guess that's just a normal thing for people to do, but it, it shows the wild way that his mind worked. Um, it was, uh, it, it's always very uh, interesting, and I, I um, even words on what's that? Are those even words on this? Yeah, like words I, on this? Yeah, I don't it's know. Really, this looks like scripts. <laughs> it really does look like, yeah. What's, like that, a, what's that up? I mean, what's the answer? Well, it's what text is that? That's a good question. I don't know the answer. It's in German, so I don't know. Um, but yeah. It's, look at look at that. Is that the word? I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, he he was a like I said he was a newspaper man and uh, in between writing all these newspaper articles, uh, which by the way a lot of the articles that were credited to him were actually written by Engels. Um, but uh, in between writing these articles, he tried to write books. <laughs> And I emphasize the word try. Uh, he was not super successful at it. Uh, he died uh, basically um, penniless and unknown. Uh, most people did not read his books. Uh, you know, compared to like someone like Herbert Spencer, who lived right near him and made massive amounts of money as a writer, and now no one reads Herbert Spencer. Why would anyone read Herbert Spencer? <laughs> we still read Mark. Um, but a lot of his works were not well read during his lifetime, uh, partly because a lot of them were not published during his lifetime. A lot of his writings were published after he died. And part of the reason for that is a lot of his works were not finished during his lifetime. He would have this uh, pattern of he would get really upset, he would get really angry, and then he would just start writing and writing and writing and writing hundreds of pages. And then he would slowly run out of steam, and he wouldn't be as upset anymore. And then <laughs> drift away, and then that thing would never get finished or published. Um, until after he died, when poor Angles had to go through all of these <laughs> crazy notes and try to compile them into, into books. Um, they also, uh, Capital Volume 1 was published during his lifetime uh, in 1867, uh, but it was not widely read. And in fact, Angles, uh, he, w he would sometimes pretend to be someone else, and he would try to get reviews of Capital into magazines and newspapers, um, pretending to be other people, and he didn't think that people would believe him if he gave positive reviews, so he would make up these negative reviews <laughs> of Capital Line 1 just to try to get people to start reading it. Um, but, uh, the, but, like I said, Marx was primarily motivated by, he would get very angry, often at specific writers, and he would just write hundreds of pages about how much he didn't like that person. And he would, you know, when I, when I said before, 
partly facetiously, but partly truly, that he was merely reporting on communism, that this was a movement that had already started before he came along. Which is what Engels always claimed, by the way, that he claimed that this was a, a, that something that had started spontaneously among the workers. Uh, oh, we've got our bubble gum! Nice. <laughs> um, so, uh, he, 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 would, he, he didn't just report on communism, he attacked it. He was constantly attacking everyone on the left. He was attacking all the socialists. He was attacking all the communists. He was attacking all the leftists. He was attacking all the liberals. Uh, he sort of methodically went through, through his whole life. If you want to read some really vicious takedowns of socialism, Marx is your guy. You will find no better attacks on socialism anywhere. And the reason that he was, yeah, he was really good at it. And the reason he was so good at it, this is a term that comes from Hegelian philosophy, this idea of imminent criticism. You know, instead of, uh, you know, when you watch these TV talk shows where people are debating, Usually the two people are like talking right past each other. They're not really engaging each other in any meaningful way because they're starting with fundamentally different values. And so they aren't really engaging in any meaningful argument. But he was engaging in an imminent criticism. He was attacking <coughs> communism from the perspective of communism. He was attacking these other writers um, on the basis of their own uh, values. And uh, he, uh, like I say, he methodically went through all these different... He also attacked Marxism. Marxism. He atta absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. So he started off, um, he was, uh, like I said, he was a student of Edward Gantz. Edward Gantz actually never got criticized by Marx. He was very lucky because he died. Uh, he died young, and so Marx just left him alone and stuck his memory. Uh, then he became the protege of Bruno Bauer. And then they had a falling out, and he attacked Bruno Bauer. Um, the famous ugh, sketchy essay on the Jewish question is in part a, uh, Marx repudiating the ideas of Bruno Bauer, who later on went on to become an extreme anti-Semite. Um, and uh, then he went through, he, um, he joined the, what became the Communist League. At first it was called the, uh, well it went through a few different names, but the League of the Just when he joined it, then it became the Communist League. Immediately he's attacking other members of the Communist League. Um, he's, he wrote a lot of things against uh, a guy named Krieger who was actually an American socialist while he was in it. Then there was a big split between the what became known as the shopper Willig faction and then Marx and Engels faction. Um, shopper Willig, um, that's actually, you know, Ted jokingly said that he was writing our coattails. The, the answer is actually the exact opposite. We've been writing Ted's coattails for years. <laughs> but anyway, uh, <laughs> it is true. Uh, but Karl Marx, in my opinion, was sort of riding Friedrich Engels' coattails, who was, uh, by the way, a powerful capitalist in his own right. Owned, uh, some, his family owned uh, some uh, factories in Manchester. Uh, and then Engels was riding the coattails of this guy, Willig, August Willig, who was kind of a strange character in his own right. He was a member of the Communist League. Um, and he was, uh, he was a member of the Junker class. He was a member of these sort of aristocratic soldiers who decided to switch sides when there was these uh, revolutions that swept through Europe in 1848 and joined the workers. Uh, and he had a military background, so he was able to uh, fight in these battles. Engels went there and fought with him. Um, Marx didn't. Marx never got involved in any actual conflicts. He was like, I'll just write about it from here, it's fine. Uh, but, um, the, but eventually they got into a big conflict. Uh, Karl Schopper, who had started the Communist League, and then August Willig, who was this military leader, they actually had nothing to do with each other. They hated each other. But the one thing they had agreed on was that they both hated Marx. 
Um, so they became their own faction, and this ended up tearing apart the, the Communist League. Um, and it, on and on and on. Uh, at a certain point after that, in the, throughout the 1850s, Marx and Engels are writing letters back to each other, which later on will become very ironic, where they're talking about how they hate all political parties, they never want to get involved in a political party, uh, and they have all these complaints about how terrible political parties are. Um, and then, uh, obviously, then they joined the International Working Men's Association, and then that too split. Uh, the so-called anarchists on one side, Bakunin and Guillaume, and Marx and Engels on the other side. Uh, so they had already gone through, you know, all these intellectual. Oh, I forgot about Proudhon, one of Marx's most important uh, pieces of writing. The Poverty of Philosophy is uh, him spending hundreds of pages uh, criticizing Proudhon's The Philosophy of Poverty. Um, <laughs> by the way, uh, he also, this was in one of those things that was never published during Marx's lifetime, um, what has come to be known as the German ideology. Um, that was, that's kind of an ironic, there's a few funny different things about the German ideology. For one thing, hundreds of pages within that book are Marx attacking this guy who called himself Max Stirner. Um, his real name was uh, Johann Kaspar Schmidt. And uh, this was Marx's co-worker. They worked together at Die Rheinische Zeitung, the, that newspaper I mentioned before. Um, they were friends. They used to go out to the bar together. Um, and meanwhile, Marx was writing hundreds of pages, much <laughs> longer than anything. If you put Stirner's works, like his complete works, together, Marx cri Marx's criticisms of Stirner are like hundreds of pages longer than all of Stirner's writings. Um, and can you imagine that? Can you imagine going to work and there's a guy who's like kind of your friend and you go out drinking together and he's been writing this manuscript of hundreds of pages about what a jerk you are? Like, it's kind of mind-boggling. Um, but like, then, okay, then we get to, to, to Capital where he's uh, attacking, uh, I'm letting this stuff get ahead of me, but yeah, that's the, probably the most shocking slide. Um, but uh, he was, uh, but with Capital, he was uh, attacking, in, in fact, the subtitle of Capital is um, Critique of Political Economy. And there was a, uh, a book that had been written earlier called Political Economy by uh, Mill. Is it James Mill or J.S. Mill? J.S. J.S. Mill. Uh, and to a large extent, um, that book is a, a criticism of these other major economists, uh, many of whom were sort of liberal economists at the time, many of them were utilitarians. Um, so he had already gone through, he had already attacked, uh, you know, various communists and socialists, and then the anarchists, now he's attacking the liberals, and like you said, he finished by attacking Marxists, uh, saying, I am not a Marxist, uh, famously, um, because, uh, of a guy named Jules Ged, uh, one of the, uh, actually one of the members of the French Workers Party, which I showed you the preamble of their uh, manifesto before that, uh, who was calling himself a Marxist. Marx didn't like the stuff that that guy was into, and so he's like, one thing is certain, I am not a Marxist. Um, but yeah, so some of his criticisms are really great, some of them are brilliant. He often has just the most um, vicious and yet accurate way of just slicing through a lot of these intellectuals, <coughs> just destroying them, and it's often really funny. You know, that's what really makes it great is that how, how funny he is. Um, it, if, you, if you ask me, my, my politics are Whatever's funny, that's correct. So <laughs> just always go with the funny thing. Um, this is, by the way, one big distinction between Karl Marx and Lenin. Lenin's never funny. 
Marx is quite a lot. So that, that's a key difference between them. But um, uh, he's, he kind of reminds me of like an insult comic. He's like uh, Joan Rivers or um, uh, who's the guy? Uh, the Don, Rickles. Don Rickles. He's a lot like Don Rickles. I guess these are old references. Those people are both dead. He's like insult the comic dog. Triumph. Um, Triumph. 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 Triumph.
Um, and at first he thought that Bakunin was some kind of agent working for Russia, which is at least kind of plausible. Wrong, but plausible. But, uh, but in that, the diplomatic history of the 18th century and its secret, he actually accused the Prime Minister of England, William Gladstone, of being a Russian agent, which is bizarre. Um, so, uh, and also, they, they not only do they have these sort of nationalistic ideas, they also, um, uh, there's a guy, uh, well, Wilhelm Liebknecht, who was one of their um, uh, closest associates, but again, it's kind of like the closer you were to Marx, the more likely he was to criticize you. And poor Wilhelm Liebknecht uh, was like fighting hard for Marx for a long time. And meanwhile, Marx was writing these letters saying, little Wilhelm gets stupider every day. <laughs> uh, and in fact, also, by the way, um, he probably also had some negative things to say about Engels himself. We don't know what they were because uh, Laura Marx and uh, uh, Eleanor Marx, his daughters, burned them after he died. Mm. So, um, <laughs> uh, he, I don't know, he was just a, he was a grumpy guy. He, uh, he, he's a curmudgeon. He kind of reminds me of um, uh, Ed Asner from, uh, from the Mary Tyler, Mary Tyler Moore show. Uh, you know, where he's like... How old are you? I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> you got spunk, kid. I hate spunk. That's, that's how I always picture Marx. So. Um, let's just keep going here. Yeah, let's get it. Let's talk about some of Marx. Uh, he, he, so he wrote these, uh, these, um, these very, 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 very complicated books. Uh, you know, his great work is Capital, Das Kapital. Uh, like I said, only the first volume was published in his lifetime. The second volume was published not long after he died. Um, the, the third volume, actually, he actually started working on the third volume. A lot of the stuff that wound up as volume three was stuff that he worked on first. And as he was writing it, uh, the basic idea of that was this um, law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. It's a little mouthful. Uh, he thought that the, the, the rate of profit was bound to fall, and he was explaining why he thought so and why capitalism was going to collapse. Um, hey, hey, hey. Um, and then as he was writing that, he started to realize that he had to sort of rethink some of his fundamental assumptions right from the beginning. So that's when he started writing what eventually became volume one. And he started thinking of uh, uh, the, the, uh, what he called the commodity fetish and trying to understand the sort of ways that traditional classical economists had misunderstood everything. Like I said, the subtitle of Capital was uh, Critique of Political Economy. Along the way, he writes these things that <laughs> look like math. They like look like mathematical formulae, but they're not. It's like a, it's like a different kind of math. I mean, you, if, a, if a mathematician looked at something like that, they might say, oh, OK, we've got some variables here. We've got <laughs> C minus M minus C. OK, well, the Cs cancel out. And then it's just negative M, right? Um, no, definitely not. Those, those, those dashes are not minus signs. But what are they? Uh, I, I got into a debate on, online one time that went on for hours about what do these dashes mean? Uh, and then you get symbols like this. Diagonal lines going up and down. That's not math. What is that? It's almost like a molecular diagram. Uh, he had a very odd way of describing things. And in fact, let me, uh, let me get out of this PowerPoint presentation. I want to show you something really fun and cool. Um, so is this an appropriate book for infants? <laughs> <laughs> At one point, Marx actually tried 
creating his own kind of calculus. He's like, I'm going to start a whole new kind of calculus. And uh, this form of calculus was based on the division by zero, which if you know some math, you know, like, what? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we say like the immortal science of communism. Talking about this, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's uh, some pretty wild stuff. You can this is another thing that's available on Marxist.org. You can read this whole um, yeah. So you can see zero divided by zero. Somehow he thought that the di the differential was actually zero divided by zero, which equals one somehow. Uh, it's some wild, it's wow. some wild, wild stuff. Um, all right, I feel like I have been talking for a long time. Um, but I guess what I want to um, sum up with is uh, a couple different things. First of all, um, we uh, and. The the, 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 the the couple best things about Marx's ideas is, for one thing, that he was trying to write a theory of understanding capitalism that was not based on morality, uh, which that was unusual for his time. Uh, he was a real... Uh, innovator in that sense. Um, you can kind of see some of the influences on, on him in that sense. His cousin Heinrich Heine, who was a poet, um, I think influenced him in that way. Also, that guy Max Stirner that he wrote hundreds of pages about what a jerk he is. Um, yeah, I, he would never admit that Max Stirner was at any kind of influence on him, but I think he probably was. Um, and that, that made him significantly different than uh, almost all of the socialists and communists that came before him. Um, in fact, one of those English socialists I mentioned earlier, uh, I think it was, uh, I think it was a guy named Blaine, if I remember correctly, uh, wrote a book called uh, moral economy, and that 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 that's how they generally saw socialism was. It was a way of making the economy moral. Marx saw things exactly the opposite way. He wanted to take morality out of, out of the equation. Um, and uh, the other thing that I think is valuable and interesting about Marx's work um, is, and it's directly related to that first thing was that he wanted to um, understand the material <laughs> basis um, underneath uh, the ideological superstructure so that uh, most of our discussion about politics happens within this uh, ideological superstructure, but he thought that the, uh, the, the basis of that in the material world was what we really needed to talk about. But even that, I think he didn't get quite right. Um, although you can see towards the very end of his life that he was moving in a direction which I think would have been um, a better direction and a direction that people can still go, which is, um, he, for some reason, you know, Angles is sending him all these letters saying, uh, did you finish this chapter? Did you finish this chapter? We need to go, we need to print some of this stuff out. We're, we're, uh, my publisher is getting mad at me. We're really, and Marx is like, yeah, 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 yeah. I just need to do this research uh, really quick. Let me just spend a couple weeks doing this research. Let me just do this. And he, for some reason, he gets really involved in soil science. He starts really investigating the, the, uh, the sort of what we would now call earth science. Um, and I think that he was headed in the right direction because ultimately um, the material basis of society is not economics, it's really ecology. And, uh, um, and the, the other benefit of that is that ecology is a science uh, with some, some, some really solid evidence that you can 
go out and, uh, and, and prove pretty uh, uh, convincingly. Um, uh, it's interesting, Marx got really involved in this critique of political economy. The people that he was criticizing, these sort of classical economists. By the way, one thing that you'll hear all the time um, from, especially from right-wing people, is that Marx didn't understand Adam Smith. He didn't understand uh, the, you know, the law of supply and demand and so on and so forth. That is complete bullshit. Uh, <laughs> Marx spent decades reading Adam Smith and reading David Ricardo and had very, very detailed, and by the way, those people said different things than we think they said. <laughs> Adam's, a lot of the ideas that we think of as being socialist ideas, you can actually find them right in Adam Smith. Um, but, uh, but by the time Marx was writing Capital, um, he was, a lot of that classical economics, classical economics had sort of fallen by the wayside, and the new so-called marginalist economics had uh, appeared and gradually became the dominant form of economics. So we need a new theorist. We need someone who will, uh, and by the way, this is the phrase that Marx himself used to describe what he was doing. He talked about, and there's a couple different ways of translating it, the relentless criticism of all that exists. Another, another translation is the ruthless criticism of all that exists. Um, and that was something that he wrote in a letter uh, when he was describing how he wanted to start a new newspaper. This is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the relentless. And by the way, take this with a grain of salt, uh, because I don't trust it anytime somebody says, here's what Karl Marx would have thought of this happening today, because who knows? Who knows how he would have changed? One thing about him is that his mind was constantly changing. He was constantly absorbing new information and constantly transforming what he thought about things. Um, but I think it's safe to say that a lot of the um, uh, leftist experiments of various kinds during the 20th century, he would have been the first to criticize them. And the reason that he would is the reason that we can tell that he would have is because he was criticizing the experiments they were doing in the 19th century. A lot of people forget that there were socialist experiments in the 19th century, and he was ruthlessly, relentlessly critical of them. Um, there's a guy named Rodbertus, who was a, an important socialist thinker in Germany before Marx came along, and he actually got into the government and started implementing some of his ideas, and Marx was like, this guy's full of shit. Um, and the, the, the letter that he wrote where he talked about the relentless criticism of all that exists, he explicitly references that. And I think we need to continue that project. We need to continue the project of the relentless, ruthless criticism of all that exists. And we can start by criticizing Marx's own works. And that doesn't mean throwing them away. It doesn't mean ignoring them. It means reading them. It means reading them carefully and uh, deliberately and critically. And um, uh, maybe I'll just stop right there and uh, see if anybody has any questions, although I can keep on talking forever. <laughs> okay. <laughs>